All right, welcome to the panel on video game journalism and the media. Um, it's my pleasure to be moderator today. My name is Florence Chi. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communication at Loyola University Chicago. I'm also director of the Social and Interactive Media Lab uh, at university. Um, and uh, I personally um, am very excited to be shepherding the, the content of discussion today by some very established uh, and uh, whippersnapper up and coming <laughs> uh, <laughs> journalists in, in the land of video games. But here are some uh, real hot, uh, contentious topics. Uh, of course, uh, the gate that shall not be named will be uh, one of those uh, hot button topics, but we also have other things that we're also interested in discussing that are following from uh, the enlightening panels of the morning. So uh, with us today are uh, Johnny Wilson, Russ Pitts, Lauren Fates, and Julian Dibble. And I am going to uh, lead off the line of questioning um, by talking about this broad theme of transitioning from what, uh, what your practice involves and how that practice has changed in uh, journalism and media to include uh, present day technological affordances, how that's changed with respect to video games um, and, and what you see as a, a current priority hot button issue. Right, so let's uh, start with Johnny Wilson. So I want to start start back in the uh, in the old days when you had lead times, uh, uh, you, when you were able to play all the way through a game before you did a review, when you weren't uh, under the pressure to be the first one to have it out. Uh, that was the uh, the golden age for for me. Uh, I worked as first an assistant editor, later editor in chief of. Computer Gaming World magazine, and uh, that's significant because it was one of the first three uh, computer game-specific magazines uh, in the world. In uh, 1981, there were no uh, computer game magazines uh, up until the fall. In September, Al and Margot Tomervik won uh, a lot of money on Password and decided to come out with Softline magazine in September. Uh, that was a hobbyist magazine that was both you know, how to make your Apple II jump up and dance and do tricks and stupid uh, computer tricks and do games and, and sometimes even um, uh, <clears throat> reviews of games, but they were real micro reviews. They weren't in-depth reviews. In, later in the fall, Computer and Video Games magazine came out in the UK. It had some really serious uh, game reviews. It actually covered some game uh, designers and it had uh, type out listings of games that you could type out yourself and people actually uh, did that kind of stuff back in those days. That same month, uh, Electronic Games came out of Reese Communications in New York. It had the infamous trio of Kunkel, Katz, and, and Worley. I wish I had time to talk to you about them because they not only started that magazine but later worked for me uh, at Computer Gaming World. And then Russell Sipe started Computer Gaming World magazine uh, in Anaheim. Uh, those were print magazines, and uh, I don't have time to talk about all the print magazines that came along, but that was in the old days before there was even uh, Ventura Publishing or Adobe PageMaker to do your uh, typesetting. Uh, so everything was a, a slow process. Sometimes um, you know, going to a typesetting studio, uh, all the screenshots had to be half-toned in order to be able to, to print correctly. There was no pre-press shops uh, you know, in, your, uh, in your thing, and, um, and it was kind of interesting. Your distribution was in mom-and-pop computer stores as well as uh, regular computer stores and, and um, uh, bookstores and the like. Obviously things have changed a lot. As the industry has grown, uh, the uh, publications became first less hobbyist publications uh, and began to appeal to, to a broader and broader audience. And then as the internet has come on board uh, and the web-based publications came into play, what we see is kind of a return to the hobbyist ideal and the, uh, and the geek uh, nerd syndrome and less of a mass market entity. We had a voice of the magazine in those days. We thought of ourselves as the journal 
of computer gaming. Some people thought we were stuffy, and some people thought we were uh, possibly too academic, although we weren't anywhere close. Today, uh, websites may seem to have a voice, but I don't think readers can identify as much uh, with the particular voice of a magazine as they can when they, yeah, they knew the editor, they knew the content, they knew the publication schedule, and they held us accountable. But that's the biggest shift that I've seen. Uh, and, of course, day and date. You're under constant time pressure now. In those days, those lead times of three months, they seem wonderful. <laughs> Russ? Uh, yeah, I think I, think I uh, came in sort of midway uh, between uh, where Johnny was just describing. I started in video games journalism uh, almost exactly 10 years ago. Uh, I had been working as a, a media producer in television, film, uh, and theater, and writing uh, freelance on the side, playing video games as a hobby. Uh, and the idea of combining the two had never really occurred to me uh, until someone suggested it. And got some gigs writing as a freelance uh, video game writer. Ended up with a full-time position at, a, at an outfit called uh, the Escapist, EscapistMagazine.com. Uh, in 2006, their big innovation uh, at the time was taking the the polish of a, of a video uh, magazine layout and translating that to the web in 2006. And it sounds ridiculous to say now, but at the time that was a very difficult, expensive, and unusual thing to do, uh, and probably four or five years ahead of its time, uh, if that the same process had happened when iPads uh, eventually became common, uh, it would have gone on to great success. But as it was, it was not something that worked out very well for them. But uh, I liked writing that type of long-form content, and we uh, produced, and ended up producing video series. I had came on there when uh, video was just taking over the web. Uh, so I was able to produce some video series like uh, Zero Punctuation, uh, Loading Ready Run, a lot of their stuff went up at the Escapist. Uh, they found some success with that, which is now their main focus. Uh, I since moved on. I helped co-found uh, Polygon.com. Uh, I was their features editor for the first two years uh, that that was in existence. Did a lot of video for them, but also a lot of long-form written stuff. Uh, and since moving on from there last July, I'm now working independent, doing some freelance for whatever magazines still exist, uh, which is not many, uh, some websites. The biggest change I've noticed in freelance over the course of my career is that the money is now going. Uh, I used to be able to make uh, 2000 uh, sometimes 3000 for a, a long feature article. I recently had someone offer me $20 for a 3000 word feature article. And I, they were friends, so I didn't punch them in the face. But, <laughs> but pretty practically speaking, it wouldn't have been worth it for me to invoice them for that uh, and get, go through the process of filling out their paperwork so they could actually pay me that $20. Uh, so I declined. Uh, I'm also now, uh, I founded my own, uh, almost accidentally, my own media company. Uh, I produce a lot of the same type of content that I was producing for uh, Polygon. Uh, I actually now produce uh, direct-to-client. Uh, as owned content for a video game publisher uh, or video game publishers who might be looking for that type of uh, in-depth, long-form reporting that frankly doesn't exist anymore in a lot of places. Uh, as the market of journalism has transitioned into more uh, video, more independent, lots more people uh, working as what we call YouTubers, uh, and as Johnny described very in the moment, uh, there is not, the, the method used to be the PR professionals would, would gather a bunch of uh, journalists in, in the same place, give them the same information, and then trust that each entity would go out and do its own type of journalism, its own type of content. From that, they would get you know, maybe a very long, in-depth piece. They would get a bunch of short uh, takes, maybe some videos or something, or previews. Uh, now, these days, most outlets are doing the exact same type of content, which is more and more chasing the, the we call it uh, chasing the lowest common denominator, but it's mm -hmm. doing the fastest, easiest, cheapest thing. So there's actually a demand, uh, a demand for the type of uh, journalism that I have traditionally done uh, directly from the publisher. So that's where I'm focusing. Awesome. So when I was a wee baby child, I was subscribed to a magazine called Nintendo Power. And my goodness, did I 
just look forward to opening that magazine every single time, seeing the full maps of those Super Nintendo games, reading the walkthroughs, and I was so psyched that someday I was going to grow up and be an adult, and I was going to write for a magazine like Nintendo Power. But now we live in an era where you don't have to be hired by Nintendo Power, you don't have to be hired by PC Gamer, you don't even have to get on staff at, you know, IGN. You can create your own brand, you know, whether you're doing it in writing or YouTube like these gentlemen mentioned. You don't have to wait for that opportunity, you can just create one. And so I come from a perspective uh, of internet blogging. I have Geek Girl Chicago, which is a blog in the Chicago Now Network, it's the Tribune's blog network. And uh, I wrestle a lot with whether or not I'm a professional. You know, the Tribune pays me a stipend, but it's not my day job. What does that mean? But I come from a very granular uh, time frame. You know, I, I have blogs that already existed when I started doing journalism. But what's already changing just in the three to five years that I've been writing is the expectation of the breadth of content that you're expected to make. So I first started writing about video games sort of casually. This is what I'm playing right now. These are my latest downloads on Steam. The demand then turns into, okay, well, why don't you write a review? So then I start writing reviews. While you're writing reviews, why don't you put them on YouTube? Why don't you do a video review? All right, I'll try that. Why don't you have Instagram? All right, I'll get Instagram. And now people aren't even just interested in reviewing of the final product, like you were saying. Now Let's Play videos are a big thing too. People will literally just watch another person play a video game from beginning to end, and that's entertainment, hearing that person's experiences, reactions, their commentary. That's <coughs> new, really, even since I started writing. That expectation is pretty, uh, pretty new. And so it's amazing to think about maybe even a year, a year from now, what is the digital journalism trend going to be? It's very exciting. Um, so my practice has changed pretty radically in the last four years, um, and that's mainly because I quit the biz and went to law school um, <laughs> four years ago, and I'm now uh, doing tech transactions at a corporate law firm here in Chicago. Um, but before that, for I wrote off and on for many years about uh, video games, um, particularly online video games, um, in a in a different sort of forum than than a lot of people here. I I wrote for mainstream magazines uh, and uh, things like the Village Voice, the New York Times Magazine, Wired, um, general audience relative to the gaming community. Um, so, um, I, I was, you know, I was not doing the kind of thing where, you know, not a review of a game for people who understood and appreciated games. I was trying to explain games to, you know, that general audience. And, you know, so what did I have to explain? I mean, I was coming from myself. I started out as a pop music critic, so it was a very similar origin. You know, you would write these reviews of bands that, you know, you understood that the audience was in the same conversation with you. When I went over to start writing about uh, the internet generally, but games in particular, it was like I had to, I had to have something I was, I was explaining to them. And, and I'm trying to think about it. the theme, the, the common thread to what I tended to be um, trying to convey was something that came up a, a little bit in the panel this morning on, on video game effects. Um, and, and that, that Thomas Wright pointed out, you know, it's the, the interesting thing is it's not the effects that are going on are not in the mind of the player, you know, sort of a direct uh, the, 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 the cultural artifact does something to your brain and then you become a certain way. A lot of what's going on is, is interactions between the players. Um, and so it turned out that what was interesting for my audience was, you know, not that video games were causing people to, to you know, commit violence, but that actual kinds of violence were going on in video games, right? It's sort of symbolic, but crossing into another line. So the first big um, 
the first big story that I wrote uh, was for Village Voice. It's called The Rape in Cyberspace. It came out in 1993. It was back when, um, before the, the days of uh, MOO, MMOs, you know, massively multiplayer online games, there were, there were MUDs and MOOs, right? Anybody? Hands, hands up? Okay. Um, so, you know, text-based uh, online <laughs> role-playing games slash virtual worlds. Um, you know, and the story that I wrote about was, well, somebody had figured out in this game how to rape somebody, and, you know, this was painful to the victims and also, uh, you know, an assault on the sense of community that was in this game. Um, later on, I got interested in, in the virtual economies that emerged in these um, virtual worlds uh, and, and MMOs. Um, and the hook there was, again, explaining there are things going on inside these video games that aren't just, you know, representational effects. They are things that are happening in the real world, and I can prove that they're happening in the real world because you can go on eBay and buy, you know, a vest of shining, uh, you know, paladin nature from whatever game for a thousand dollars. And this was a fascinating story to the outside world, but you know, it was a window into the fact that games and digital games are different from cultural forms that we've you know, we're more familiar with in that things are happening on a social level. They're not just being represented, they are actually happening. And so as a, as a kind of final side note to, to my practice as a journalist is that, you know, that, that's maybe of interest to a lot of people here is that from the beginning, um, the work I was doing, the stories I was telling were attracting a lot of legal scholars because they're, of course, you know, we have a whole new world in which to rethink, you know, how social interaction uh, happens and gets uh, mediated and and governed and uh, and managed. Um, so that I think is 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 part of the the interest of of games as a as a cultural form, um, and for my particular brand of journalism, and, and, and I think everybody's here. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, John Fessinger, who's uh, the author of Video Game Law, um, has argued, video games are really interesting emergent space um, in that they provide a window into what the arguments will be in new media in general. Um, about sometimes 10 years before um, the, the rest of the world catches up. So we're at the forefront of actually getting uh, an insight into what the arguments in communication technologies will generally be. Um, and so, you know, uh, I wanted to ask you, given all these um, transformations and transitions um, through your practice, um, what is a professional journalist in 2050? <laughs> well, not me. I moved over to academia. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, professional journalist. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting question in, in relation to video games. I have, for, for me and my practice, I have tried to focus on areas that I would see uh, an intersection in uh, traditional journalism. So when I uh, report on a video game, for example, I, I, I try to report on the people making the video game, and I try to make that an experience that a reader who may not necessarily be familiar with video games might also enjoy. Uh, sort of a, a look into the creation of these products as opposed to the products themselves. Um, and obviously, as I, as I described earlier, there's a good, there's an easy transition into doing that direct to, to client. Uh, the last thing I just did on a, uh, Harmonix is now making a rock band for, and I did the uh, launch doc documentary video about how they're making that. That's a product I did recently, uh, which is a good, uh, it was good for them. I gave an insight into their team. They had uh, objectives they wanted to hit, and it was good for me. So I certainly enjoyed making that. I wouldn't consider that journalism necessarily, um, but I actually come from the school where I'm not sure I would have ever considered uh, what I have done. I can't speak for anyone else, uh, but what I have done journalism, I, I see video game journalism as it as it's currently exists and as it's always existed, more of a product-based journalism. It's not necessarily 
you know, I used to say this to a lot of my teams, and, and nobody liked hearing it, but, you know, none of us is going to win a, a Pulitzer for reporting on uh, Call of Duty, right? Uh, this is not war reporting. Uh, these, are, these are products that we are reporting on to a consuming audience who wants to hear about them to make decisions about whether or not they will buy them. Um, so what does, what does that look like in 2015? Uh, looks a lot like uh, what, you know, what our uh, young colleague here described. It's very much the, and I think even that is going to change. I'm already hearing now I'm interfacing with PR professionals who are getting frustrated because even working with YouTubers and bloggers is, is becoming complicated because there's a lot more of them now. Uh, there's rules, as, as we heard uh, in the last panel, there's now new rules uh, that they're going to have to be working under. Uh, so is that even the future? I, I don't know. Uh, but I think the act of journaling uh, about video games to the video game audience is becoming more instantaneous and more transparent. Uh, and I think it looks less professional than it ever did, even though, it, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say it is less professional. In the ancient world, there was a more clear separation of church and state. <laughs> and, um, you know, we used to talk about a Chinese wall between edit and advertising. You know, that doesn't exist anymore because uh, the editors don't control the banner ads. And, um, you know, we used to at least be able to say, don't put the ads right next to the edit because it looks like they bought the edit. And we don't necessarily even know what the ads are until they're there. But the, the same thing is true. But in journalism, my rule was always... Uh, it does the reader need to know this? So if there was a major merger coming in the, uh, in the industry, we would dig out every story that we could get on it. If you know, uh, Origin Systems got tremendously angry at me for breaking the EA Origins merger back in the day. Uh, Spectrum Holobyte wasn't too happy that I broke the uh, Microprose Spectrum Holobyte merger before Hasbro uh, surprised me by buying uh, Microprose uh, thereafter. But uh, it was always, this is going to affect the reader because it's going to change the mix of product. On the other hand, a major licensed product went up in the, up in the nose of a developer, and, um, and I didn't really think that it helped the reader to know that uh, that product had done that. The company had made arrangements to license another engine to be able to do their licensed product uh, the way that they wanted to do it, uh, and... Um, that developer needed the chance to go to rehab, and he did come back, and he did do some major products. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but, you know, I can tell you uh, it, it was a licensed game, and um, the company would have been, you know, up a tree if, if I had uh, written that story. We may have had a symbiotic relationship, and there may always be a parasite in the symbiotic relationship, and journalists are usually the parasite, uh, but uh, a professional journalist really pays attention to how it's going to affect uh, his readers or viewers and how it's going to affect the industry. And um, whereas if the industry was doing something wrong, you know, I wasn't afraid to speak to it. But if it was just something that was going to harm the industry because of a, of a personal indiscretion, I didn't see it necessary to break that story. But that's just me, and a lot of people have told me, you're not a good journalist because I said that. Uh, Lauren, you had an interesting insight with regard to the previous panel regarding uh, yeah. disclosures. <laughs> That's why I wanted to talk about this mm -hmm. today. So um, I don't necessarily have a concrete definition of professional video game journalist because I don't think right now there is one. And I have a lot of feelings about that. Mm -hmm. um, in the last panel, I believe it was Greg brought up that if you work for GameSpot, if you work for IGN, you don't have to necessarily disclose in your writing that you got a free review copy of a video game. But uh, what he called mommy and daddy bloggers, which are a thing, they have to because that's what the law says. And so I'm a person who's sort of stuck in the middle of that. I'm paid by Tribune to be a blogger, but my title is still blogger, and so I still have to make those disclosures. I still have to be upfront in that way. And as someone who tries to be as professional and as true and uh, valiant a, as possible, it makes me feel untrusted. It makes me feel, you know, your opinion and your writing and your expertise and intelligence aren't as good as this person over here who happens to work for a bigger fish company. And I don't think we're done fighting that fight and defining those lines, 
but who gets to answer those questions, right? The video we just watched in the last panel uh, was a case that happened this year, the EA case, in which a judge was saying, I think that the, the typical greeting card is more, uh, is more expression, has more expression than a video game. Clearly this person has not played video games. Um, they've not, you know, gone through a hundred hours of Skyrim or Fallout 3 and like wept at these choices you have to make. That's not greeting card caliber. That is a different thing. And I want to be told that I am more credible than that person who doesn't have that experience. I feel more professional, at least in terms of video game know-how, than that judge. And that judge is the one who gets to decide for me. And so we have to work through that together. And I'm glad we're, we're talking about it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just want the, this question of you know what is a professional journalist anymore is is an extremely broad question that touches on you know, the the entire range of journalism right now. But to bring it into to our focus, video games journalism, um, I, I think um, you know there is a. Can there ever be a professional video games journalist? Right? So, so if we look at it from the perspective of, of what I've been doing, you know, trying to explain video games to a general audience, that's I don't think that falls under the rubric. But I think, it, with, traditionally with cultural forums, we had a pretty good sense of when, you know, the life cycle of the new cultural forum when it arrived at the moment of you know professionalism, and you know, for you know, a lot of cultural forums like film um, and TV, that was kind of the moment when The New Yorker hired a critic, you know, to write about in this particular forum. So, you know, when Pauline Kael started writing about film uh, at The New Yorker, you know, when they started doing television reviews at The New Yorker, that was sort of like, well, we've got, you know, professional film critic is now a thing, you know, or, uh, you know, professional TV critic is now officially formally a thing. The question is, when are we going to have, you know, the professional game critic moment at the New Yorker? Um, and I think it's an interesting question. We're getting close. I mean, how, have you, how many of you guys uh, watch House of Cards um, and noticed in this recent episode that, um, you know, not only does the president, you know, play video games, we've, we've known that for all the seasons, but he reads professional, you know, video game reviews, and, you know, this, this you know, great novelist, Tom Yates, you know, came to uh, the president's attention because of a, of a review that he wrote of Monument Valley that was so, so moving that it actually convinced him to, you know, like, you know, venture out from first-person shooters into a little um, iOS game. Um, so it's there, like the culture can handle the idea of a highbrow video game critic, but it's still, you know, in the realm of fiction. Um, but that, that puts us like one step away from like having a New Yorker critic of video games. But the question is with, with these games, I wonder if that's really going to happen. First of all, you know, the entire idea of the New Yorker could disappear before it happens because it could happen at any moment now, um, the way journalism is going. But also I think with film and TV and other new cultural forms that have come along and we've got to watch this process happening, they didn't have the kind of ecosystem, uh, the sort of um, sub-journalistic ecosystem that gaming already has. This, this fascinating bubble of interlocking modes that you were talking about, you know, the Twitch broadcasters, the, you know, the forums, the, all these things, which kind of displace, you know, that authoritarian voice of the highbrow critic in a way that makes them barely credible. Um, so, you know, I, I'll be interesting to see, you know, if, if professional game critic ever becomes a thing in the way that we've understood other cultural forms. Mm -hmm. So this leads us to talking about how, um, on the one hand, traditional power structures in media and representation have um, been disrupted. But on the other hand, are we being naive? And how are um, power structures that are dominant reinscribed in our, in our current um, outlook? So when, when we talk about what is legitimate, 
who gets to be a legitimate gamer, who gets to define what gamer is, all these things have been thrown into question as of late. Um, and so these conversations are taking place in an unprecedented level of visibility. And so what are we supposed to make of what the conversation is? You know, I would, I would say that, that that ties in very well with what Julian was just saying. Uh, and I think the, the, and we've been asking this, and I remember back when I was at the Escapist, I remember I, I probably asked Julian to write something for me about nine or ten times. And, and during that time, about a decade ago, there was, um, there was the frequent conversation, where's the Pauline Kale of video games, right? Where's the Lester Bangs of video games? And I know that's, that's what uh, Julian, or I assume that's what Julian was referring to. And I, I would tend to say that that question is not going to be answered, and I'm not sure we will ever have that person, uh, because the interactivity of video games make them, by necessity, much uh, more easily splintered uh, in terms of audience, in terms of experience. Uh, you don't necessarily have to like war movies, for example, to, to sit in a theater and experience one. Uh, and perhaps even find something you might like in that experience. Uh, but if you're not a uh, uh, if you're not an RTS player, or if you've never played League of Legends, it's going to be very hard for you to pull that experience, pull what 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 is valuable from the experience of playing League of Legends out of that experience because it's impenetrable to you, right? I'm <laughs> I'm describing my experience with it because I've never played it, although I'm certainly aware of it. Uh, you know, there's. I think the uh, new technologies and, and mobile games and iPads have made it a lot easier for people to get something out of a video game. Uh, but that question of who is a real gamer depends on who is asking it, right? I think there are lots of people playing uh, uh, streamable games uh, competitively right now, and if you're not one of them, then you're not a gamer in their eyes. Uh, I, there are plenty of... Uh, Moms, dads, nieces, and nephews. I, I had an experience uh, a couple of Christmases ago, actually. I, I took my iPad to my mother's house, and, uh, uh, and no one in my family had had one at that point for, some, for whatever reason. Uh, and my mother spent uh, uh, five hours playing Spell Tower. Uh, and my six year old niece uh, played uh, Angry Birds, right? Uh, and my brother played something else on the iPad, and then my uh, stepfather played something else. Everyone in the family got the experience of, of playing a game on this device, whereas if I had brought a PC to that house, probably none of them would have, would have played anything on it, right? So what is a real gamer? I think that's a, this is a long-winded way of saying I think that's an unanswerable question. Uh, I obviously deal with this question a lot because there's a lot of gatekeeping conversation going on in the world about um, gender. Uh, you know, you're, you're a girl. Are you into video games because of your boyfriend? No, I, at eight years old, was playing my favorite video game of all time, which is Earthbound, aka Mother 2, and at the end was in tears. I was experiencing emotions from a video game that at eight years old I hadn't yet, and it resonated so deeply with me that I'm getting a piece of that game tattooed onto my body. And I don't want anyone telling me there's a such thing as a real, true gamer. To me, that's as real as it gets. I don't have to win a tournament. I don't have to review the games you like to prove to you that I'm a real gamer. But what's exciting, right, is that we are expanding the definition of what a gamer is every freaking day. Twitch plays Pokemon was one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen. Millions of people banding together to play this video game, just like as a consensus. And I don't know if you've heard of Fish Plays Pokemon, but it was inspired by Twitch Plays Pokemon, and it was literally just a goldfish swimming around in a tank, and when it drifted over specific buttons, the Pokemon game would react, and we tried to have a fish playing Pokemon. So, you know, my mom plays phone games. I've been playing games since I was tiny. A goldfish is playing games. We're all gamers. I don't think there's a such thing. I, I respect that fish, and may that fish rest in peace, because I think it died. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I also think there's a logistical problem with having a central voice or an authoritative voice, uh, and that is that it takes sometimes 
hundreds of hours to really play a game all the way through. So nobody is going to have the time to be familiar with all the games. And without being familiar with all the games, you're not going to have street cred. And back when Computer Gaming World first came out, we only had to deal with about 20 or 30 games a month. You know, between a few of us, we could handle that. So when I would go out in the industry and, and interview designers and do behind-the-scenes uh, stories, you know, they would always say, Johnny, you know, like this, or like this game, or like this mechanic, or whatever. And I was conversant with it. And so in very real sense, I thought I was going to be the central voice of, uh, of gaming as the industry matured. Well, what a surprise to me that, you know, as we have matured and technology has come along, everything has flattened flatter than Valve's corporate structure. You know, basically <laughs> what we have is uh, uh, anybody can be an authority in any one game. And so it's impossible to have a central authority. So it's impossible to have the Pauline Kale uh, or the uh, uh, Charles Champlin of, uh, of movie reviewing. But this is why it's <clears throat> fascinating, though, that this has become such a fraught Discussion. I'll be the first one to say the word. You know, the Gamergate um, scandal, um, controversy slash toxic morass, um, <laughs> seems to be wh whatever else it's about, and we all know it's about ethics and video games journalism. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but is also about this question of who is a legitimate gamer and and. You would think, given that there is no longer a central voice in the industry to really officially decide that, uh, everyone could go off and do their own gamer thing and, and feel they're gamers and not have to fight over it. Uh, I think it may be, in fact, that there is no central authority and people feel anxious about it. They want there to be one and they want to have you know, the final word on, on the matter. What are some issues that you all have run up against um, in your practice to do with Gamergate? Uh, I can start on that, I guess. Um, so my experience with Gamergate is interesting because I've tried to be, in, in all things, I try to be as empathetic as possible. I try to put myself in other people's shoes and understand why they have the feelings and opinions that they have. And when it comes to you're not a real gamer, uh, you're not speaking ethically because you didn't, you know, whatever, um, it just doesn't, people have the instinct to be territorial, I really feel. Um, and when you're the first person to get to something, when you're the first person to like hear about something and like it, a lot of people in geek culture, in gaming culture, come from a past of isolation and bullying because they loved the thing they loved first before anyone else did. I, I think, was the only person in my, you know, eight-year-old class who was playing video games. I took a lot of heat for it. I got bullied like crazy, and I still have self-esteem issues in my adult life because of how I was treated. And I could, take a, I could take a territorial stance on that. I could put a wall up and say, well, now you all like video games, and you're not allowed because I earned that badge, and I got there first. And that's not fair because just like movies were once a new thing, just like commercial flight was once a new thing, eventually we all do it and we all love it and we all get on board and you have to acknowledge that that's where the train is going. You can't have a clubhouse anymore because we're all going to be a part of this now. And it's strange to me that that's even still an argument considering we have fish playing video games, that you know, my direct experience with Gamergate has been, I've never made an official statement about it and yet, I've gotten attacked over it. I've tried to just ask the community questions, you know, explain it to me, tell me your stance on this. And because I used the hashtag Gamergate on my Twitter, I was on like 15 lists within 30 seconds because there are people out there who have rigged their computers to bust you when you use the hashtag so they could come and tell you how wrong you are. And I think that's crazy. I'm just, I'm just trying to ask you about how you feel. And you want to come at me with, you know, my legitimacy as a journalist, my legitimacy as a gamer. And it's really hard to, A, take you seriously. 
and B, sympathize with what I'm sure is actually making you feel a lot of distress, which is something you want to talk about as a Gamergator. I, it's hard for me to engage if that's how you're going to treat me. And so, again, I appreciate a, a place where we can talk about it civilly because my experience has been negative. Yeah. A question to the general um, panel. Um, what issues do you feel um, Gamergate highlights for um, law? For law, interesting. Yeah. Curious to hear specifically what Julian has to say on this one, but I'll, I'll say very quickly. Uh, I think it was 2006 or 2007. I wrote a piece about uh, uh, alluding to the tragedy of the commons in terms of online uh, spaces. At the time, we were seeing a lot of activity in, in um, uh, MMO communities. Uh, it, there was a clear pattern. Uh, most MMO games, Second Life, Sim Online, uh, Sim World, or whatever they called it where the game would start relatively small, people would build a, a community, a sort of passionate, vibrant community, uh, and then slowly but surely the, the penises would take over, right? Uh, almost inevitably, any game community would, would become filled, filled with penises. Uh, and you saw it happen recently with Minecraft, and, and my former uh, colleague, Yahtzee Croshaw, called it the, the, the golden you know, phallus uh, principle, where you could only build so many amazing things before someone eventually uh, decides to build a penis in Minecraft, and then it's all penises all day long. Um, and actually, when I interviewed uh, uh, people from Microsoft, uh, for I recently did a history of uh, Xbox Live uh, for Polygon, and they, uh, they would call it, they were testing their uh, camera feature uh, for games like Uno, uh, when the camera came out for the Xbox, you would want to, you know, they wanted you to be able to play Uno with other people online over Xbox Live. And they had what they would call time to penis, where they had someone whose job it was to sit in, uh, at Microsoft and play Uno with random people, and they would time it how long it took this, this young woman to, to, to encounter a penis on the other end of the, of the camera, right? And it was like 12 minutes, right? Uh, so it's like <laughs> you heard it. You heard it here first. <laughs> Twelve, <laughs> minutes. Uh, Twelve minutes. TTP. Who knows? For crying out loud. Twelve minutes to penis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's my new favorite hashtag. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from my perspective, you've got this long tradition of gaming communities turning sour. Uh, it happens to almost every one of them, uh, without question. And you know, in some cases, it's the community expands to the point where it becomes an attractant to people who are less inclined to take it seriously or to play nice. In other cases, you have communities that, that exist on the internet outside of the game that become interested in that game or that community because they're popular, right? Uh, groups like uh, Something Awful was the, was the big community when I was uh, writing a lot. 8chan, of course, uh, was the source of the Gamergate, uh, or what, right, a home of the Gamergate. Uh, controversy, and then it's just people who know that something is popular, and then go there to cause trouble because they get enjoyment out of that. That's their enjoyment; it's causing trouble for other people. Uh, I think what we're seeing now with Gamergate is the, the the internet itself has become the community. Right? Uh, tools like Twitter have made it possible for everyone to engage over not just one video game or not just one passion interest, but the world, right? We share the Super Bowl with each other via Twitter. We share House of Cards with each other via Twitter and, and social media. So the community is now us, and it's worldwide. And we're, concurrently, we're now seeing people go on, on there trying to cause trouble for us in that world because they get they get enjoyment out of that. Well, it, yeah, you you asked. What I think, and I hope it's not because I'm a lawyer, because I do contracts, and that's it, and I don't, and don't know how to apply it to Gamergate. But as someone who's been watching this phenomenon for for decades, like you know, I said the first big story I wrote was about somebody you know waving his virtual penis around in a in a in a you know a, a cozy little online gamer community, um, and then later because. You know, I had sort of told it from that story from the community's <laughs> perspective and was, you know, constantly having to retell that story to interviewers and things um, and retelling it in a version where the rapist was just kind of black boxed as a, you know, as just a, an irritant in the community that, you know, generated this community response. It was interesting. I started becoming interested in, in, in the irritant and, you know, what motivated them. And you know, I started 
writing pieces about griefers and trolls, um, and, and they're kind of, you know, uh, upsetting but fascinating and, and very entertaining culture um, uh, of memes and, you know, and rules and, and all that stuff. Um, and I guess I would say, you know, to the extent that there's, a, you know, any kind of feeling we want to legitimize in in that community, the the, the griefer troll community, um, it, it's you know we heard this earlier today. There's a kind of sense of I don't you know it's not that I'm invested in General Custer's revenge. I just want it to be out there so that it sets this kind of outer limit of freedom of expression, um, and. I think that's an interesting but complex and nuanced and potentially dangerous uh, idea because, you know, it, it recreates this dynamic that you were talking about, Russ, of people wanting to, like, you know, come in and see, oh, this is this, like, stifling, cozy community. Let's blow it up and, you know, show, you know, sort of just how awful things can be so that, you know, we can define the limits of, of behavior online in a way that's more freeing than, you know, what we're seeing in a lot of these communities. And insofar as that intersects with the law, I think it's an interesting question. One thing is that, you know, it's, it's more like how, how people need to have start having a more sophisticated understanding of the law to understand that the fact that, you know, the First Amendment is out there to protect the outer limits of your freedom of speech don't necessarily mean you want to exercise that freedom all the way up to its limits in communities, online communities. You know, there's been a lot of resistance for many years on the part of developers to institute tools that could make these communities more livable. Um, and it's it has to do with these kind of I think kind of uh, vulgar ideas of, of, you know, the importance of free speech and, and the First Amendment. I think we need to sort of start developing a more uh, uh, more sophisticated folk, folk theory of the law. I can tell you actually a really hard, uh, I, I completely dodged the question earlier, but I can tell you a really hard example of where this is going to intersect with the law is I had to my wife is also a journalist, uh, and she uh, works at Games Radar Plus now. Uh, she, the volume of hate mail, and she's uh, similar, uh, she had never spoken out about Gamergate in one direction or another, and never even used the hashtag in social media. We both made a conscious decision to not even address it, pro or con, because that's not the kind of work we want to be spending our time doing. Nevertheless, by virtue of being a woman writing in games journalism, uh, has gotten such a, an overwhelming volume of uh, hate mail uh, and threats and just hor just horrible stuff. Uh, stuff you can't, you know, you say, what kind of emails do you imagine show up in your wife's in inbox? And you would just never want to, to even imagine this stuff showing up. Uh, we had to contact our uh, police uh, department and let them know that by virtue of my wife being a female journalist, someone might decide to, to threaten to swat us, right? I don't know if you're familiar with swatting. It's when uh, someone you may not know uh, will call your local to police de local to police department and tell them that you are a terrorist, right, or that you have uh, bombs or that something is going on in your house that will necessitate police action, uh, usually in the form of a SWAT team showing up and kicking down your door in the middle of the night, right, and tear gassing you. And this has actually happened. There's actually uh, a judgment passed down, uh, I think, yesterday. Uh, a young man in California uh, charged. I don't know if it's a judgment. I'm sorry. I'm not a lawyer. I'm going to get these things mixed up. Uh, officially charged uh, with swatting uh, people randomly uh, because, and I'm not sure what the judgment will be on that case, whether he'll be charged with uh, waste, wastefulness, right, and wasting police resources, or whether he'll actually be charged with some uh, uh, direct action against the people he targeted. But I would imagine, as someone who has had to speak to their, first I had to explain to the, the, the Durham Police Department what swatting was. Uh, and then I had to explain to them what uh, video games were. Um, <laughs> and then Twitter, uh, that was interesting. It was a very long conversation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you have that much trouble in the triangle, I don't know what's going <laughs> to yeah. happen out in rural America. Well, exactly. <laughs> so that, that's where I think the law will intersect, is when we start to 
acknowledge that these things that are in technically virtual worlds do have a real life uh, consequence, right? And where the where where the actions people take because of these virtual worlds intersect with our rights as human beings in the real world, and that's probably going to be the first. Unfortunately, that yeah. kind of harassment and uh, threatening activity is going to be the first place. Yeah, there have to be sufficient physical danger and sufficient economic disaster uh, to affect uh, a legal suit of any kind that will settle it. Uh, All right, which goes back to the point I was making earlier. Part of the fascination of digital games is that they really, you know, expand that line or blur that line between, you know, what's happening as a representational imaginary activity and what's going on in the real life. These things spill over. Um, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that, you know, as a cultural form, swatting now is this, this ritual moment that happens in a Twitch broadcast, right, where you, you'll, you'll swat the Twitcher you know, who's broadcasting their game because it's funny to see them swatted on Twitch and, you know, uh, so it's really kind of tightening the circle between real life and gaming in, a, in a, an alarming way. So it's probably a, a, a productive line of reasoning to talk about uh, not so much digital dualism, but <clears throat> the fact that whether online, offline, digital, or what have you, um, these... Uh, it's a matter of harm done. Yes. Like, so ethics, um, doing no harm, and um, trying to mitigate harm as it's defined in uh, digital uh, forums. So um, at this point, we're, we're kind of running down the clock here. Um, I'd like to open up the discussion to someone out there who has a question for the panel. What do you think about this? What, what about if we, like Jesse Ventura once said, you can't legislate stupidity. He was talking about a law that we wanted to pass to prevent people from driving in front of trains. And you know, he basically said you can't, can't make a law. It's not going to be effective. And I think that might apply to a certain degree to poor behavior online. Um, this is uh, the, the wonderful technological advancements that have allowed people like Lauren to do what she does allows these people to do what they're doing. Um, but unlike Lauren, they're not beholden, uh, or rather they, they, they are beneath, underneath this umbrella of protection of anonymity. And so what you're seeing is a forum, the internet and the services that we use, that facilitates or, or allows these people to exhibit unbridled poor behavior that they naturally tend to anyway. But when they go down to the soccer field, they have to comport themselves uh, a certain way or they'll get kicked out of the soccer game. If they misbehave in a grocery store, they might be on a CCTV recording. Now, as I said, I don't think you can legislate this. I don't think, the law, I don't think prosecution is the answer. But what if, we, what if we manage to get the key players like Twitter, Twitch and Facebook, just those three right off the start would uh, make a huge difference and get them to strip away, not anonymity, because we don't, I don't think we as a society want to completely lose that, uh, the ability to um, put, put opinions out there with, uh, without some kind of potential for protection, like if Lauren wanted to talk about Gamergate under a different account because she didn't want to feel threatened. I, my, my own organization didn't weigh in on Gamergate on the hashtag because we were worried about what would happen. Uh, so not removing the potential protection of anonymity, but the guaranteed protection when the law is involved. So perhaps you couldn't create a Twitter account without some sort of identity verification, which would not be visible to the community, but would be available to law enforcement if it, if it came down to a case where law enforcement wanted to act on a, an incident. And so then I, I as, uh, let's say I'm a bad actor and I want to harass somebody, I make a Twitter account, but I can't do it without linking it to, I don't know what form of identification, but there would be a trail that could come back to me that would encourage me to curb my behavior. Well, these these are complicated arguments that are that go beyond games as well, as we see with the Arab uprising and um, the role of social media and anonymity playing a part in um, 
the process of revolution as well. So this is, this is one of those debates that are happening and there's not a clear cut answer. What do the other panelists think? I was just gonna say, I don't necessarily disagree with your idea. I think it could be a good idea, but that wouldn't solve the issues I personally have been experiencing mm -hmm. because I have been harassed and threatened by people with their first and last name on Facebook and on Twitter, but I've you know submitted my complaint to Twitter and I've had Twitter tell me, we don't think this is a real threat. We don't think anything's actually going to happen to you. This doesn't violate our code. And so in order for your suggestion to work, these organizations also have to take steps like we've been talking about over here to recognize how this affects people in their real lives and to take it seriously. Because sometimes those people are happy to say exactly who they are and it still happens. So it's not just isolated to an issue of anonymity that is um, germinating the, uh, the abuse. And it, uh, anonymity certainly doesn't help the matter, but it's not isolated to anonymous voices at all. Right. That's, that's astonishing to me. Right now, there, games are all different, right? There are different genres mm -hmm. of games. You have your click point and click adventures, your adventure games, your first person shooters. So there's no real standard format for games. If we couple that with um, what you guys were talking about of you know, game journalism not having a true authoritative voice. I'm curious about how you guys view, uh, how you, how you view um, the idea of having a citizen cane of, the, of video games. Is that realistic? Should we even stop trying? What, what should we do here? That's funny, because I was thinking about that the whole time I was watching that, that <laughs> previous panel. That was the first thing that popped on my mind. Like, are we even going to get yeah. a Citizen Kane? I don't know. Uh, it's an interesting question because I think you've certainly, right, what do we say, what do we mean when we say the Citizen Kane right. of video games, right? It was, a, it was an amazing film. It presented bigger ideas in a more interesting way than I think a lot of people had, had, had come to expect from films, right, at the time. Uh, it was very well crafted uh, in a lot of ways. It endures as a classic by, that, by the virtue of that. I think when you talk about video games, you come up with a, with a very hard, uh, you come up against a very hard barrier to, to being able to consider something a classic by virtue of it being a technological experience, the technology itself continuing to change. And we've, seen ex uh, we've seen examples of video games that the, the underlying technology had become obsolete while the game was still being developed, right? much less after its release. Uh, I talked to, for a story I did a couple of years ago, I talked to the people at the, uh, who run the archives at Disney, right? There's an actual team of people and there's a head archivist. So everything they have ever done, every, every scrap of paper, uh, she was describing to me how she was transcribing notes written on napkins from meetings with Walt Disney right back in the day. Like literally every, everything in existence from every project they've ever done they've kept, including the, the, the final product, right? But so, they, so in order to keep the final product of every video game, for example, they've been associated with, they also have to keep an example of the machine that that video game was played. So now they're, uh, now they're archiving machines. So they probably have one of the largest collection of video game machines in the world because they need to be able to have a working example of every video game they've ever played, right? Uh, nobody else is going to do that. Uh, so when you say a classic game, there probably have been uh, or some you know, uh, Citizen Kane's of video games, or at least video games that have expanded people's perception of, video, of what a game can do and been crafted in such a way as to make them classics, but that we can no longer play because the technology is obsolete, right? I think, and this goes to a lot of the questions we've been we've been touching on here. It's such a it's such a broad medium with so many different ways of approaching it, so many different things that can be expressed. Uh, that it's very hard, I think, to make that comparison. But my short answer would be, I think it's our it's already happened. Mm -hmm. We have time for Thank one you. more question, and for those of you who want to ask remotely, I'd like to remind you of the hashtag CVGLS. So uh, post your questions to the hashtag on Twitter if um, we don't have time to hear you from the microphone. So one more question, if you please. Um, so my question is, because this whole thing seems difficult now, why do you guys still do it? Fair. Great question. <laughs> wow. I'm out. <laughs> and I'm out. Uh, uh, well, very quickly, 
I've never had a real job, you know? <laughs> like, uh, I've been a television producer, I've been a cameraman, I've been a, uh, I've built sets uh, in theater, I've produced, I've written and produced plays. I've, you know, this is a way I may, I will probably never make a video game, right? Uh, but I enjoy the, the medium so much and I want to express myself through the creations of others in a way if I can. I, I, I'm, I feel driven by what I see. Uh, the people I know who create video games uh, uh, are also driven by, which is a, is a sort of a need to to get that idea out there. And to me, the idea is is the the love that I see in the eyes of the people who make these video games, and they express it through the video game itself. I try to express it in the stories I write about them. Uh, so two part answer, and I'll make it as quick as possible because I know we're almost out of time. But for one, I have loved video games and sci-fi and comics and general geekery since I was born. I remember making Star Wars characters out of Duplo Legos and, you know, because I've loved these things so viscerally, I can't shut up about them. And I've tried. I've tried to stop blogging. At one point I got frustrated and I did turn it off and I, I came back because I'm so bursting with enthusiasm for these art forms that I couldn't shut up about it if I wanted to. But the thing that I think keeps me going day to day is the people that I meet uh, at events like this one, at conventions. There are so many people who don't have the, the privilege of having an outlet like I've created for myself, who have thoughts on being bullied, who have thoughts on video games as art, who agree with me about, you know, meeting Ness in Earthbound for the first time, and when they come up to me after a panel, or when they clap after I say something on a podcast that's being recorded live, I realize, like, we're all doing this together, and if I'm not writing, if I'm not talking about it, I'm doing a disservice to both the things I'm passionate about and the people who are touched and inspired by it. And so it makes it worth it for every troll that wants to say something horrible on Twitter. There's a hundred people who are grateful and happy and smart and inspiring to me. And so thank you guys for keeping me going. In addition to covering the industry, I always perceive myself as an ambassador for the industry. And today I'm doing it by training new young designers for the future. Um, in a similar fashion, um, I teach game studies and new media and communication. And if we didn't talk about these issues, um, the awareness wouldn't be there. And these are future decision makers, so it's our responsibility to help educate the next generation. So with that, um, thank you so much for uh, being a, an intellectual contribution to this panel. And um, if you have questions, please follow up with the individual panelists. But thank you so much.